much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, at, at the very onset, I would like to extend my thanks to the IOA and subcommittee, uh, Dr. Sudhir Kumar, and also to uh, Rajiv and uh, others. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's indeed a great honor. So my brief is to talk on phalangeal fractures and to keep it as simplified as possible. So at the very onset uh, declaration, there is no conflict of interest in this presentation. I'll only be giving you a very broad overview of phalangeal fractures as applies to day-to-day -day practice. And in the interest of time, uh, I won't be able to go and cover uh, in-depth pediatric fractures, uh, arthroplasty options, or fusion options. And I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, Dr. Adam Watts from Edinburgh Handcourse, from whom I've uh, borrowed a couple of slides in this presentation. So when you're dealing with hand injuries and day-to-day -day practice, it's very important to obtain a very good history. And uh, very importantly, uh, you need to take into account the age of the patient, the hand occupation, and the hand dominance, right hand and left hand and dominant hand, the occupation of the patient and the functional demand, and also take into account the mechanism of injury. The points which you want to consider when you're dealing with phalangeal fractures are whether it's an open or a closed injury, whether the injury is intra or extra articular, the site, whether it involves the head, or the shaft, or the base of the phalanx, whether it's undisplaced or displaced, whether there's a rotational component to the fracture, whether it's a stable configuration or an unstable configuration, and last but not the least, whether your patient is a compliant patient. The principles are very simple. You try and mobilize them as early as possible. Stiffness is the greatest worry. You try and inflict as minimum a disruption of the soft tissue as possible. If they are stable configurations, you mobilize them early. If they're unstable, you need to splint them and fix it. The basic requirements, I feel very important for all of us who are wanting to fix phalangeal fractures. Number one is surgeon temperament. It takes a certain kind of temperament to deal with these fractures and patience is a virtue. You need to be familiar with the anatomy, uh, especially the collateral ligaments, the various tendons, ligaments, neurovascular bundles, etc. You should have a working knowledge of the commonly available splints and it will be very good if you have the services of a dedicated hand therapist. In terms of internal fixation and surgery for these fractures, your inventory should necessarily include fine K-wires of 0.81 millimeter diameters, etc. It's useful if you can have access to a small battery-operated drill with a K-wire, call it by no means this is absolutely mandatory, but it makes life a lot easier. Your inventory of hand implants, and preferably when you're dealing with small intraticular fragments, it's wiser to use loop magnification, and uh, bipolar diathermy is always useful. Hand splits, basically, there are two subtypes. They are static splints and dynamic splints. Uh, and one should be very familiar with the commonly available splints when we're dealing with this fracture and the indications for each of them. And also, one cannot overemphasize the safe position of immobilization. This has been described by James. It's also known as the Edinburgh position or the safe position. This is where uh, we prefer to, how we prefer to immobilize a finger fracture uh, uh, in a splint or after surgery. This is with the MCP joints in 70 to 90 degree flexion, the wrist in about 30 degrees dorsiflexion, and the IP joints should be kept extended. This is to pre-tension the collateral ligaments, and this will ensure that, you know, following rehab, you get a good functional outcome after fixation or after splintage. The common complications of badly managed fractures, you don't need to emphasize malunion, non-union stiffness, and post-traumatic arthritis. Let's uh, start with distal phalanx first. Uh, this is from the AO manual. Uh, they can be classified by the stuff fractures, shaft fractures, which can either be transverse or longitudinal, and dorsal base fractures, which commonly the eponymous be known as the bony mallet finger injuries. And we also encounter uh, the volar base uh, bony aversions of the FDP, the jersey fingers. Often we have uh, associated nail bed injuries, which should be factored into the treatment. And uh, this could take the form of nail bed injuries, aversions of the nail plate, skin lacerations, or subungual hematomas. Treatment. In general, for distal phalanx fractures, usually easy. The majority can be treated with splinting or a KYR fixation of some sort. The bony mallet fingers can be treated either by a mallet finger splint or in some cases where there is a little amount of joint subluxation or a large fragment, you need to resort to techniques such as individual fixation of the fragment or extension block spinning, which we'll talk about in a minute. The jersey finger with the evolution of the FTP necessitates reattachment of the evolved FTP back to its bony bed of evolution. So uh, let's take, uh, for example, this bony mallet finger. Uh, now, basically, you can see uh, the joint is not congruent. But if you use a splint like that, uh, 
you can get it back to a good position and then if it goes on to heal in about five to six weeks in the splint you get a good result and then you can start physiotherapy now ishiguro came up in the year 1994 with this technique of uh, a mallet finger using extension block pinning i'll just run a very quick animation so you see this involves basically a k wire uh, you know you run this k wire uh, just uh, proximal to the small bony fragment and then you extend the dip joint to achieve the reduction and then you pass in another axial k wire to complete the fixation and this is a very elegant way of treating this fracture very simple only two k wires and no other inventory required and then you get a very good result now for jersey finger uh, you often have to take into account how far the tendon has retracted into the palm and this is often uh, clinically visible when you see the loss of the finger casket in this case it's the ring finger which is commonly involved this requires an open approach and fishing of the tendon and reattaching it usually to a suture anchor or a pull out suture and you get a good result with this technique now i'm going to talk a little bit about middle and proximal phalanx shaft fractures now if you're talking about shaft fractures they can be either transverse fractures which are usually stable and can be immobilized for 3 weeks in a splint of your choice or they could be spiral fractures which tend to displace because they are unstable and they should be stabilized preferably by some sort of internal uh, dynamic traction or uh, internal fixation one should check for rotational deformities now sometimes these can be very subtle and they can only be you know uh, ascertained if you look carefully at the direction of the fingernails and see if any of the fingers rotated and in some cases where you see in the picture on the right hand side on your screen the rotational deformity might be quite obvious Phalangeal fractures, if they are extraarticular, can be easily fixed by percutaneous K wires. And as in any long bone fixation, the important principles are to maintain the length, alignment, and rotation. And usually, uh, these do not pose a huge problem, and you, one can get a very satisfactory result. One should, however, uh, bear in mind the safe zones for insertion of K wires. And this slide is uh, from Dr. C. Rex's textbook. Uh, and the green zones are safe zones to which you can pass your K wire without impaling any. important ligaments or muscles and tendons for extra articular fractures where uh, you need to uh, achieve early mobilization in a high demand patient sometimes you might need to resort to internal fixation in unstable fractures so this can be achieved either in the form of interfragmentary screws or you can use a uh, internal fixation in the form of a small plate from the handset and this will give you a good result and the incision usually employed for this uh, internal fixation is uh, the mid axial incision i'll just show you in a minute so this is uh, achieved by the the landmarks for the incision very easy you flex the finger and mark the apex of the skin folds and then this is done with the pip and the dip joint completely flexed and then when the finger extended you get a straight line which is the incision which you require and you just choose the length of the incision which you require intraarticular fractures uh, can be particularly challenging and this requires a slightly more uh, uh, challenging skill subset and uh, you know uh, these are not easy fractures to fix by any means uh, and uh, unless the joint congruity is restored uh, functional outcomes do not uh, uh, appear to be satisfactory one should take care that once you achieve internal fixation your fixation should be sufficiently stable allow to allow early mobilization otherwise the whole purpose of internal fixation is defeated if you have to inflict a prolonged period of immobilization after your inadequate fixation in these fractures so you only get one chance at this fracture so it's best to get it right first time planning is very uh, important it's a paramount importance in these cases so you might take recourse to a ct and it's always a good idea to use loop magnification so sometimes you get a condylar fracture now while these are not necessarily always treatable by necessarily treated by internal fixation you can get away by carefully placed k wires and maybe sometimes a small external fixator uh, as a neutralizing defect and you can still a uh, uh, neutralizing device and you can still get away a very good result with uh, without resorting to internal fixation sometimes the displacement is uh, quite significant and you don't have any choice but to fix it and this is done by a midaxial approach as i alluded to earlier and then you can get your internal fixation and then once that's done you get a good result after rehabilitation sometimes for bicondylar fractures now these can be a real problem and the usual midaxial approach from one side does not give you sufficient access to both the condyles and in such cases you might take recourse to a dorsal approach and reflect the flap of extensor tendon and then proceed with internal fixation using a mini t plate and then 
uh, once you have done a adequate fixation with careful rehab, you can still achieve a good result in these nasty fractures. And this is six weeks post-op in this case. Now, intraticular fractures, uh, which involve the base of the PIP joints, now if they're undisplaced, they can be treated by splints. So you can see that fracture there. Uh, I think Pankaj will cover the dislocation part, so I will be only sticking to the undisplaced fractures. And if it's a uh, volar aspect undisplaced fracture, this can be uh, very easily managed with a dorsal blocking splint, and uh, this gives a very good result. If they are displaced, now dorsally, you can see this, what is uh, probably what represents a central slip bony avulsion, and these can be repaired either with a screw, if the fragment is large enough, or you can take use a, a, a suture anchor, as has been done in this case. Uh, this is a bioabsorbable anchor, so it doesn't show, but the fragment is back in its original bed, and the K-wire has been just used to uh, provide additional stabilization to the PIP joint. It will be removed in a couple of weeks. Comminuted fractures of the base of the phalanx or the felon type of fractures. Well, uh, Suzuki in uh, 1994 uh, published in the Journal of Hand Surgery British and uh, he described his external uh, fixator to provide dynamic distractor by using contoured K wires and rubber bands. So, if you have a fracture like this, this is how your frame would look like. It's just three transversely passed K wires which are bent to form this frame and using rubber bands. This is how you get a dynamic frame, and I'm just going to show you how it works. Early mobilization straight away. That's a dynamic fixator, which sort of gives you very good stable fixation and early mobilization. So another form of dynamic distraction has been described by uh, Badia in 2005. It's the Badia frame again, two transversely cast fast wires in a fracture like this, which you can see on your uh, right hand side. And this is the frame construct, and this is how it looks and gives a good result. When we are dealing with base of proximal phalanx fractures, which are extraticular, uh, one needs to be a little bit aware of the deforming forces which uh, cause this particular type of injury to angulate. So basically what happens is you have the intra OCI which is uh, pulling the uh, proximal fragment into flexion, and you have the central slip, the extensor tendon, which is pulling the distal fragment into extension. So what happens as a result is you have a fracture which angulates volarly with the apex volar angulation. And any sort of treatment should be directed at, you know, uh, deforming this, you know, neutralizing this uh, deforming forces. And that can be done simply by the use of a splint. If you put it in this position, then you're neutralizing the deforming forces. Or alternatively, you can take recourse to cross-spinning using K wires of any configuration. And that's also uh, eminently uh, suitable. So if it's an intraticular fracture involving the base of the proximal phalanx, sometimes you can take recourse to not only a distraction, but you can use a combination of carefully placed K wires and internal fixation screws to uh, achieve a good congruent reduction of the uh, joint, and that will determine the outcome. So in conclusion, the take-home message, uh, early mobilization is the key. Uh, we try and use the least invasive intervention that will achieve the aims. We should be aware of our own available skill subset and also the infrastructure available to us. And we should anticipate the compliance and complications and a carefully done surgery usually will yield very good results. Thank you very much for your patience here.